Well, what the heck is going on? I see this album cover sort of levitating mysteriously on my computer screen or my telephone or whatever it is that the pejorative, the figurative I am staring at right now. I, of course, meaning you. I guess it's not that mysterious because you can see the hand holding it in place, which does sort of give away the game. Sort of like peeking behind the curtain and seeing the Wizard of Oz himself. Which means I might as well just go ahead and dispense with all pretense. Dispense with all pretext. Dispense with all pretension. Get rid of all pretending. And indeed reveal the face of the man behind the album cover. Surprise! It's the man who's on the album cover. Me, Malcolm Tent, coming at you from the greater Danbury, Connecticut area with this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. How do you like them apples? Mm, yes, 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 yes. We're doing it right here. We are all the way live, baby. No jive, no fooling around. Every Wednesday, provided that I am indeed in the greater Danbury area, at 7 o'clock p.m., that's 7 o'clock p.m. I can do this. I'm fairly coordinated. 7. 7. <laughs> 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard, Standard Time, you will indeed find Tent Talks Tunes hosted by me, Malcolm Tent. And yes, it has indeed been um, two weeks since I was on Tent Talks Tunes last. Keeping alive the spirit of cable access television with a cheap-ass camera and a homemade backdrop. Look at that. My girl Chrissy gave me a big Devo blanket for Valentine's Day this year. <laughs> Makes me all mushy just thinking about it. I don't, I don't get into mush per se. I don't like to be mushy, but I'll admit I got kind of mushy when I unwrapped this Devo blanket and was told that it was for me. And it does make a rather good backdrop, does it not? few people think it makes a good backdrop. Let's see some thumbs up. Let's see some smiley faces. Let's see some hearts. Let's see some reaction and some action. James Pogo has commented specifically that he likes the new backdrop and asks the eternal question, are we not men? I think we know the answer to that. Pear from Sweden. What do you think, dude? How's that thing look over there in Scandinavia? Like it? I like it a lot. One might think that I'd be doing an all Devo program today. Ooh, somebody sent a frowny face in response to the Devo backdrop. Who out there is frowning at the Devo backdrop? Hmm? Make yourselves known. We might have to have a spirited intellectual discourse here. Because if you've seen me more than once, you know that I am thoroughly in touch with my inner devolved self. Hmm. Yes, Ms. Kit E. Cat, also from the great state of North Carolina. Great present. So thank you, Chrissy. And this will get, definitely give me a backdrop to show next time I do a Devo-themed program. Don't know when that'll be, but it's nice to know that we have the means to give you the eye candy required for such a thang. So yeah, I've been gone for uh, two weeks now. So let's get right down to the meat of the matter, A-Q-A-P, as quickly as possible, and uh, check the calendar, and the rest of the show will be devoted to checking the bulletin board and checking the mailbox, because it's been quite a very busy week in terms of those things. We're going to get right down to it. I'm going to check the calendar first in a retro fashion, but first I'm going to lean on over here and click the refresh button. Just to make sure that I am still indeed on the air with this internet stuff, you never quite know. All right, looks like I am on the air. You guys get to have the exciting vista of me leaning in close to the camera, and you get a big old close-up of my stubble and uh, what's left of my teeth. 
Um, are we still on? I can't see what's going on. I see a, a wheel spinning around, but I don't see myself on the screen. What does this mean? What does this mean? Okay, looks like I am still there. Good. So, um, yeah, we're going to look at the calendar. And we're going to first look at a retroactive calendar because today is a very important day in my personal history. Three years ago today, I was standing on stage in Lexington, Kentucky, playing my third ever show with the Almighty Anti Scene. Yes, we were on tour with I Hate God and the Obsessed. It was a most excellent tour. It was a great way to be inaugurated into the world of Anti Scene. So just that much more than three years ago today, it all began. And I see that the unimpeachable president for life himself, Jeff Clayton, is tuned in. I want to salute Mr. Clayton and Mad Brother Ward and Sir Barry Hannibal for welcoming me, welcoming me aboard the death train and having me on board, helping to stoke the fires for the last three years. I want everybody to give a big old salute to the almighty anti-scene. One of the most fun gigs I've ever played in my entire life. Mr. Tink Tink knows what I'm talking about. Mike Lesser from the great province of Vancouver, British Columbia knows what I'm talking about. Thumbs up to everybody. So that was three years ago today. And that also ties into the product that I was waving around at the beginning of the show. You got it, baby. The Malcolm Tent solo album which is not just an album of me doing songs and things like that. It is a career retrospective of many of the bands that I've been in, from Broken Talent to The Residents to They Hate Us to Number Station to Ultra Bunny to The Bunny Brains to They Hate Us to all kinds of stuff. And it is very germane, today's topic, to today's topic because there is a track on here by Anti-Scene which was indeed recorded three years ago tonight on stage in Lexington, Kentucky. A red-hot version of the song called Sabu, which is still one of my favorite songs to play the Thunder Lumba to when we're on stage, baby. It's a rocker, it's a roller, it's a burner. So if you want to uh, relive the history three years ago today, all you got to do is get yourself a copy of The Multiple Moods of Malcolm Tent. Hit me up. Mr. Tink Tink says it's a great record and he loves it and he knows what he's talking about. Colored vinyl. Something approximating handwriting on each label. 35 years of rock and roll went into the creation of this album. So you want it, you need it, you gotta have it. One song on it was recorded three years ago tonight. Very important. Don't miss out. And that brings us directly to the meat of the matter. The tofu synthetic turkey of the matter. Current events on the calendar. We do indeed have a calendar, a real-life printed calendar, with some artwork on it. And we are in April. Let's see, April's not too eventful. We flip the page to May, and ah, oh, May... May, 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 may be an epic month. In fact, it will be an epic month because on May 20th, in Charlotte, North Carolina, at the Tipsy Borough, Anti-Scene are playing live. It's an early show. It's a no-cost-to-you show. The Tipsy Borough is a great restaurant with awesome Mexican food including vegan options for vegans like myself. We're going to have a fellowship supper before the gig, as we typically do, where everybody can come and sup with Anti-Scene and meet and greet and hang out, and we'll do all the regular rock and roll stuff, things that we do at an event like that. And then we're going to rock your socks off. We're going to rock them that night. We're going to rock you that night. And you know what I'm talking about if you've seen Spinal Tap. Mm-hmm. Then, the next night, May 21st, in Virginia Beach, Virginia, we're playing a big old show. I, of course, 
neglected to print out the flyer for said show. But if you go to antiscene.com and or the Antiscene Facebook page, or if you hit me up directly, you will see all the info you need to know about the May 21st gig in Virginia Beach, Virginia. It's going to be stormy. It's going to be stormy. Woohoo! I'm receiving a personal message from Ms. Gelman in Tucson, Arizona, saying that she's not allowed by me to comment. I don't know what that means. I don't know why that is. I'm sorry. I can't do anything about it right now, but I will do my best to address the situation, the situation in the future. This Facebook stuff, who even knows? Who even knows? I know that Ms. Gelman, Ms. Gelman, you've spent plenty of time in Facebook jail. I wonder if your rights as a Facebook citizen have not been curtailed because of that kind of stuff. I wonder. Somebody out there might know. Anybody out there spent lots of time in Facebook jail? What are your rights? Do you even have any? Post a comment. Help a sister out in Tucson, Arizona. She's a good egg. She needs some hep. She needs some hep. So, anyway, I need to get rid of these messages because I can't see the comments as they come on up. Um, was in North Carolina last week playing shows with the Almighty, with the Almighty Anti-Scene. I must say they were great, great shows, both of them. Going back in time, the most recent show we played was April 1st at Reggie's in Wilmington, North Carolina with our good friends the Street Clones and Knowledge is for Fools. Love playing shows with those guys because they're both great bands and they both make us work extra hard when it's time to hit the stage. Jeff has mentioned this on his Break On Through Facebook broadcasts, which he does every single Tuesday at 5 p.m. And you should, you should not miss it. It's a lot of fun. Lots of prognostication and lots of rumination when old JC takes to the internet airwaves. But Jeff has talked about this on his thing, and I agree with it completely. I want to play with bands who are really good. I want to play with bands who are doing their best to blow us off the stage. And that includes any band I'm with. Anti-Scene, They Hate Us, Ultra Bunny, The Bloody Apostles. When I go out doing my solo acoustic thing, I want it to be a quality show from top to bottom. I want it to be every band as a killer with no filler. I like the competition. I like being put to the test. And that night in Wilmington, I got my wish. We all did. Knowledge is for fools and street clones. Aces all the way. And the same was true for the night before in Spartanburg, South Carolina, when we got to open up for Wednesday 13, who I've heard much about but didn't know anything about, really. I remember hearing some of Wednesday 13's early stuff, the Frankenstein Drag Queens, who Jeff Clayton was instrumental in launching. And I really liked that album. But I didn't know anything about Wednesday 13 and his career after that. Let's just say I was pleasantly surprised when I saw how professional and how showman-like Wednesday and his band were. They really kicked butt. They got the place going. They got us going. Dynamite show. And the opening bands, Black River Rebels, Rebels, Black River Rebels, and Blackwater Rising, also arose to the occasion. Young bands, up and coming. They really rocked it. They did a good job. And if you want to see a full video of our performance, go to the Anti-Scene official YouTube channel and you will find it posted. There's a playlist called Some of Our Favorite Videos of Us. And you will find that Spartanburg gig. It's like a full 30-something minutes. And um, it, it's great. It's worth watching. And we got an update from Ms. Gelman. It says that Facebook unfriended us, which is why she couldn't comment. All right, what, what can you do except shrug your shoulders and roll your eyes over a development like that? Are we surprised? Yeah. Are we surprised? No. Ugh. It's the question that answers itself. It's not a conundrum. It's just the way it is. So anyway, we play these awesome shows. And of course, while I was there in North Carolina for... 10, 11 days, 
I got stuff to bring back and show you guys. The kind of fanboy geekery and freakery that makes all of us tick, tick, tick. Yes, yes, yes. Fun stuff, objects, things that you cannot download, things that do not stream. Murray Gelman, you know what I'm talking about out there in Tucson, Arizona. Murray's a rocker. He knows what fun it is to go scour the stage after the gig and find the set lists. Oh, my stars and garters, do I love to collect set lists. This is not even all the set lists that I got. I mean, this is just a few of them. The rest of them are packed away in my uh, pedals bag for the Thunder Lumber. I've got my various distortions and fuzzes and overdrives, and I stuffed a big old wad of set lists in there from the uh, most recent shows. Didn't have time to get them. But I got enough to show and tell you right now. Check this out. Two different varieties of an anti-scene set list. Here we have the handwritten one for rehearsal, and here we have the official printed one for the gig. Handwritten, printed, rehearsal, stage. Am I wacky enough to want to save them both? You better believe it I am. And if you look very carefully on this one, for our song Ruby, there's a cryptic notation that says Aerosmith. Why on earth would I have written the word Aerosmith next to the song Ruby on our, on our set list? Tell you what, I know why. Jeff Clayton knows why. Maybe if you watch the video on YouTube, you'll see why. Why do I do that? Because it's more fun to preserve a little mystery and give you guys a sort of Rubik's Cube puzzle to solve. It's fun. Rock and roll is supposed to be fun, baby. What other set lists do we have here? Oh my gosh. We've got a Wednesday 13 set list. As part of Wednesday 13's traveling rock and roll show, they plaster the entire backstage area with set lists and with itineraries that detail load-in time, sound check time, meet-and-greet time, load-out time, curfew time. I just, I love this kind of stuff. The real nuts and bolts of how a rock and roll show is run. I can, I can look at this stuff for hours just for pleasure. That's how much of a fanboy I am. I get a real kick out of, you know, just seeing all the details and what's involved in putting on a show. It's just an awful lot of fun. Playing a show is in many ways not enough. Studying the mechanics of it is a part of the package. That includes set lists, and that includes call sheets. <laughs> Here's a set list from uh, Blackwater Rising, one of the opening bands in Spartburg, Spartanburg. I save them all. Whenever I get my hands on a set list, I save them all. I got boxes of the things, boxes of them. And to me, it doesn't matter if it's a comparatively new, comparatively unknown band like Blackwater Rising, or if it's the Rolling Stones. You know, they're both valid. They're both equally a product of somebody's artistic vision. They're both the product of a band going out and playing a show and putting enough care to know what song goes after the next and playing them right. I think it's fantastic. And of course, you know, if uh, Blackwater Rising ever gets to be to Rolling Stones level, I can say, guess what I got from the time they opened for us. <laughs> Mike Lesser, who used to sing for the Gay Cowboys in Bondage, a South Florida band who I looked up to back in the early 1980s, says that he never saved a set list ever. Mike. Shame, shame, shame. But on the other hand, good for me, because it's people like me, the catfish of the rock and roll industry, who save these things for you. And in fact, this kind of relates. This next object I got... See, I'm, I'm going in a very random order right now. I'm letting the... Oh, sorry, Blackwater Drowning. Thank you. Thank you. Black River Rising, Blackwater Drowning. I'm going to be 58 years old this year. What do you want? The Cognition. 
he was never that good to begin with. So just as much as, yes, and JC has pointed that out, Blackwater drowning, thank you. Just as Mike Lesser relies on people like me to save the set lists, I rely on all of you to keep my pronouns straight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, John Bridges says, old man tent, indeed, you guys should only know. You youngins like John Bridges, just you wait. Just you wait. <laughs> it only gets better. It only gets worse. The key is it only gets. As long as it keeps on getting, baby. A drink a toast of Dan Barry tap water to getting while the getting's gettable. To paraphrase Hank Ballard. Fifty-eight years on this planet, and all I got was an astounding thirty-nine of them in the rock and roll business, baby. You gotta get while the getting's gettable. So anyway, Mike Lesser, formerly of the Gay Cowboys in Bondage, reminded me of an object that got mailed to me by my old friend and mentor, Leslie Wimmer. Whoop, we're going to sidetrack. Earl Cox says he's got an old set list from a Murder Junkies show and Mike Denied sang. That's a rare item. Mike Denied was not in the band for very long and left under the uh, usual acrimonious circumstances, dare I say. That's rock and roll, you know. Save that set list. And if you ever get tired of it, send it to me. Malcolm Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470. I'll put it in the box with all the other ones. And maybe someday, if I actually do it, I'll put it in my book of set lists. I've had this idea in the back, 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 back recess, recesses of my mind to publish an eight and a half, eleven, eight and a half by eleven book of cool set lists. What do you think? I think it's kind of a good idea. What do you guys think? Should I do it? It could be really cool. Some of them are very artistic. There's some name bands. There's some unknown bands. But the thing is, they're all cool. And I think a book of set lists would be really neat. And I see some thumbs up for that. So yeah, maybe I'll move it one notch up in the back, 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 back of my mind list. Anyway, Mike Lesser from the Gay Cowboys and Bondage reminded me that Leslie Wimmer sent me some things in the mail, including this incredible vintage issue of Tropical Depression. Tropical Depression was probably the best or at least most professional punk rock fanzine printed in South Florida in the early 1980s. And this is issue number three from 1984. And um, it was really cool because it had some stuff from there that I had plum forgotten about. Check it out. On the very inside front cover, a flyer for the exploited show that occurred when, when Broken Talent was on tour in July of 1984. And then later on, the Minutemen playing at Flynn's, which I was in town for and which was mind-expanding. You know, the definition of the word psychedelic is literally mind-expanding. So seeing the Minutemen live on the Double Nickels on the Dime tour 1984 was psychedelic in the strictest sense of the word. Whew, we look through this here issue of... Yeah, that's right. Gay Cowboys and Bondage open for the Minutemen. And there is audio and video of that concert available through me. Talk to me if you want to see it and hear it. Not the Minutemen, but the Gay Cowboys and Bondage. Very important. Just here, how about this? A fanzine interview of the Alarm. Before the Alarm were, you know, gigantic and huge. This is great stuff. This is priceless. No Trend. Anybody out there remember No Trend? Their classic song, Teen Love, one of the most misanthropic bands that ever lived. Really, really good stuff. Oh, look at that. Broken Talent. My first ever band from South Florida. Our first interview. Boy, were we snotty. We were young, we were snotty, and we weren't nearly loud enough. A review of The Clash playing Fort Lauderdale, the post-Mick Jones lineup, with the headline, The Clash Sell Out Every Show. What else is in here? Oh, look at that, a, a two-page spread of the Tropical Depression 
hardcore bash, including a photo of Broken Talent that I plum forgot ever got taken. And a, let's see, a two-page two TSO. Well, ah, there they are, the Gay Cowboys in Bondage. Look at that full-page ad for their Owen Marshmallow Strikes Again EP, a monumental slab of South Florida punk rock. Look it up and listen. I guarantee satisfaction. If you dig the kind of stuff I dig, you're going to dig it. Dig. Dig. And uh, tons and tons of record reviews and something else that made me uh, quite excited, a half-page ad for the Broken Talent record, which I have not seen in 39 years. So that was pretty cool. And as Mike Lesser pointed out, thanks to the publisher of Tropical Depression, Tony Latino, for putting out a fine product. And thank you, Leslie, for sending it to me in the mail, along with a couple of really cool CDs that I know nothing about. What is this one? Record of Shadows Infinite on the Crucial Blast label. Apparently it's some ambient noises and things like that. I'm intrigued. And a really cool David Bowie promo-only DVD from the year 2003. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I have listened to a lot of David Bowie from every part of his career. And he was pretty damn good from the very start to the very end. He put out a few dud albums. And this might be uh, worth an entire episode. I could talk about David Bowie easily, as I think most of you could. Like, Never Let Me Down, shite record. Tonight, shite record. Sorry. Heathen, it's a techno record. I just don't like techno at all. But um, by and large, Bowie was pretty dang good from start to finish. So I'm really intrigued to take that thing and put it in my DVD player. <laughs> if any of you guys remember those things. You know, DVDs are going to make all other music formats obsolete. Remember that? Well, believe it or not, I still have a DVD player. So I can play that David Bowie DVD. And I'm going to do it. And here I have a rubber band, which just completely at random for no reason at all, I'm going to shoot at my telephone. There, just because I could. What else did we pick up while we were at the gig? Well, in Wilmington, a fan of the band and a really cool dude named Clay Criswell, Clay Creswell, gave me a book he wrote called Sharks in the Shallows, a book all about shark attacks off the Carolina coast. That is what we call a niche topic. And I love books like this. Fascinating, detailed accounts of a very niche topic. Lots and lots of words. I saw some graphs in here. You know, picture of a shark. Statistics. It's awesome. Just the kind of raw data that I can really, really wrap my head around. Great fun. So thank you, Clay. And Clay, you gave me a copy of this book to give to P.P. Duvet, who is really fascinated by sharks. That's how this whole thing began. We were talking about how P.P. Duvet, the lead singer of the Murder Junkies, They Hate Us, and the Bloody Apostles, loves sharks. So Clay, he's going to get his copy of this. No problem. Mm -mm -mm. Let's take a big slug of fresh water and toast the shark book. However fresh Danbury tap water is, I don't know, but hey, you wake up every morning and you take your chances. You never know what's going to go on. Yes, Earl, you sent me a picture of the set list via Messenger. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. I'll take a look at it when I'm able to take a look at it. I'm kind of multitasking right now. You got to bear with me a little bit. Look at this. This is something else I got in the mail while I was in North Carolina. Stack of cassettes. Hmm, interesting. Cassettes. Can you guys see what these cassettes are labeled? Can you see what they're called? I don't know how my camera performs. I don't know what the lighting is like, but they're labeled 
Q988, Q442, Q345, Q164, and Q451. That sounds like a uh, big stack of like uh, noise tapes or something like that. Some kind of avant-garde weirdness. Perhaps a band named Q, and they name all of their releases numerically? Could that be it? Could it be some kind of secret code? Could it be something that you would un only understand by listening to a number station? What is this? What is this? I'll tell you what it is. These are actual tapes, actual cassette tapes, from the Jonestown Archive at San Diego State University. I've been in touch with the folks from the Archive who run an excellent website. If you're interested in cults, cult religions, and specifically Jonestown and the People's Temple with the Reverend Jim Jones, I cannot recommend highly enough the website, which is called Alternative Considerations of Jonestown. It is a deep well of information about Jonestown, presented in a purely factual manner. It looks at the issue from every angle, pro, con, rational, irrational, lots of contributions from survivors of Jonestown, relatives of survivors, incredible source of primary material, including lots and lots of audio. And these are actual cassettes from the archive. And, you know, everything from the Jonestown archive can be found online, digitized, but this is real analog. Real analog. And these all, if all goes well, have music from the Jonestown house band called the Jonestown Express, which I cannot wait to put my ear around. It's probably going to be pretty lo-fi, but it's still, this is fascinating history, and it's all on tape, real tape. So, very excited about that. And thank you to the folks at the Archive who helped make this possible. Mazel tov to you. All right, that's mail. What else did I, what did I get when I was at the gigs in person in North Carolina? Stuff. Swag. My main man, Andy Miller who I saw was tuned in a second ago. He's the lead singer for Knowledge is for Fools. Requested that I bring him a CD of the Malcolm Tent Power Duo featuring Mad Brother Ward. And that is a 60-minute soundscape noise sculpture created by me and Mad Brother Ward, the guitar player for Anti-Scene. It's not rock and roll, baby. There is no rock and roll to be found on that thing whatsoever. But if you love sound for the sake of sound, I recommend that release. A lot of care and effort went into it to make a non-rock and roll sonic piece. So I brought this thing to Andy, and Andy had his merch table set up at the gig, including probably 2,000 buttons. When I say buttons, I mean not buttons that will fasten your shirt, but buttons that you will put on a shirt. How about that? Black flag, a flock of seagulls, red sovine, baby, Ronald Reagan, The Clash, I really popped my cork when I saw this one, Disco Duck, Y'all might remember the factoid that the first record I ever bought with my own money was Disco Duck on 45. Do I still have that record in my collection? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Do I still play it on occasion? You better believe it. You know why? Because Disco Duck is a good song. Disco Duck is a real good song. When I bought that record for 99 cents at the Treasury Department Store in Hialeah, Florida, the cashier laughed at me. But I knew she was wrong. She was wrong then. She's wrong now. Let's give a big Danbury, Connecticut salute to that cashier and her elitist 
bullshit jive. We don't do elitism around here. We like what's good. And if what you like and what you think is good does not completely agree with what I like and what I think is good, so what? You like what you like. If it's good, it's good. Period. Jeff Clayton can quote the opening lines of Disco Duck, and he has just done so. I don't know if I could have done that. And I've owned the record for 45 years. If anybody is out there and wants to post a link to Disco Duck, please do. Please do. So thank you, Andy Miller, for trading all these great pins. <laughs> Gilligan's Island. I am going to be sporting these things. And this harkens back to the day. And some of you, some of you old timers who were into things like buttons and grew up in a place like South Florida. Where I grew up, <clears throat> there was nowhere to get a button in South Florida. You just couldn't do it. If you wanted to get, <clears throat> for example, where is that clash button I showed you a second ago? I don't know where it went. I threw it over there. Or even, you know, for gosh sakes, a red Sovine button. If you wanted to get a button of some cool band to put on your shirt, you had to mail order it. And this is a true fact. I had a mail order catalog from a company called Square Deal. They were in San Luis Obispo, California. And every, you know, three months or so, I'd get a big old newsprint catalog in the mail from Square Deal. And I would leave through that thing from page to page. They sold import albums. They sold import 45s. They sold cutout albums. And they had buttons. They had new wave and punk rock buttons. All pictured in rows on each page of their catalog. Excuse me. And I would order from, from a place in California, The Clash, The Specials, Devo, Joe Jackson, um, you know, whatever I was really into at the moment. I had to mail order to California to get a button. Fill out the order form. Go to the 7-Eleven, get a money order for the amount of money, or get my mom to write a check. Put it in an envelope, seal the envelope, put a stamp on the envelope, write the address, put the envelope in the mail, and then wait for six to eight weeks for the package to arrive from San Luis Obispo. If I wanted a button back then, I had to wait eight weeks to get it. Who out there remembers that? Does anybody remember all the work that you had to go through to get a button? And was it the same where you lived? Was it the same in North Carolina? Was it the same in Vancouver? Was it the same in Connecticut? I mean, because South Florida was, was and still is a very backward place. So to go through all that effort to order a button was really something. Also made it extremely special when the package finally arrived. And you could finally rip that package open and hold in your hands after eight weeks the treasured buttons and put them on your shirt and sport them proudly. I, I wore those buttons to high school every day. And um, even though nobody got it, people, I remember people being really interested. They were like, what is that? It's got a band on it. They didn't like any of the bands, but they were definitely intrigued by the object itself. That was pretty cool. It's nice that it's easier now, but there was definitely a process involved that was very satisfying back then. So buttons are cool. Mike Lesser says that he has a McGruff crime dog button. Yes, McGruff. You know what goes hand in hand with buttons? Stickers. How about a big stack of anti-scene stickers? Now, you people know that I love doing mail trades and that I'm the king of mail order. So if you write to me, Malcolm Tent, P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470, 
and send me something, I'll send you something in return. Including stickers. Hell, if you just write to me and say, will you please send me some stickers? I'll probably do it. Because we got this model of stickers. We've got, what else do we have here? We got some Bloody Apostles stickers somewhere on my desk. We've got this design of anti scene sticker. Which I designed, just saying. Got that. We got some of these. I don't know if I'm gonna if I'm willing to part with all of these, but I could part with some of these really cool stickers on a roll. Anybody remember the stickers on a roll that were a huge thing? These were all made by Jeff Clayton, man. He got Planet of the Apes. We'll get to this one in a minute. I'm a Lazy Sod by the Sex Pistols. Cute and cuddly G.G. Allen. Yeah, I actually got a pretty fair number. Jeff was very generous with these. I could send some of these to people who want them. Planet of the Apes again. What is this? Hey, a logo for Long-Haired Weirdo Records. You can stick these all over everything. You can put them on your lunchbox, put them on your book covers, put them on your book bag. If you're a working stiff, put them on your toolbox. If there's people in your neighborhood you don't like, you can stick them on their, on their front door. Not that I advocate vandalism. All right, I'm sure they'll come off, but still, you could do it. Yeah, great stuff. So Long-Haired Weirdo Records and another sticker for this guy. If y'all can see that. Who is this? Scott Savage. Who is Scott Savage? Well... I'm going to tell you who Scott Savage is because this also relates to something I picked up while I was on the road. And this is some really cool fanboy geekery. A record that I got while I was in North Carolina, Scott Savage, Memento More. This is a cool record. Long story short, and if you want to hear the long story... I invite you once again to go to the Facebook page of Anti Scene and or the Anti Scene official YouTube channel, and you will hear stories of Scott Savage and the Streets Living Theater, who were a crucial independent original band, excuse me, in Charlotte, North Carolina, starting in the late 70s. And they were headed up by Scott Savage, who released this one record in 1978, Gypsy Moth. backed with Savage Grace. And Jeff Clayton just reissued this 45 on his long-haired weirdo label. And even if this record weren't, like, sort of a part of a story that I'm sort of a part of, it'd be really awesome because, I don't know about you guys, but I love original music, and I love regional music. And I especially love original music that never made it out of a particular region. You know, it goes back to, like, the 60s and even the 50s, like the 60s garage band scene, for example, had thousands of bands who released 45s that never made it out of their hometowns, whether it was Des Moines, Iowa, Lexington, Kentucky, Hialeah, Florida, for that matter. And so Scott Savage and Streets Living Theater were one of those bands who were very well known in their hometown, but not so much outside of their hometown, and they made some real high-quality music. This is a great record. This is a really good record. Even if I weren't connected to it somehow, I would give this record high marks. <clears throat> it's one of the only records I've ever heard that actually has an identifiable Doors influence, and I mean that in a very complimentary fashion. You can definitely hear the Doors in the A-side, Gypsy Moth, all the way down to the poetry break towards the end of it. It's a really cool original sound, and I mean original. Never honestly really heard quite a record, never heard a record quite like this. And the B-side, Savage Grace, also very, very good. So it's been reissued after being out of print for 43, 44 years. It's on two colors of vinyl. Blue of which there are 160, I believe, uh, yeah, or 190, 190 on blue, 
360 on red. Beautiful opaque vinyl pressed at Cascade Record Pressing in Oregon. So if you like original 70s rock and music you may have never heard of before, I definitely recommend the Scott Savage. Do I have copies for sale? Of course I have copies for sale. Would I like you to buy some from me? Of course I would. But there's no obligation to buy, baby. Check it out, though. If you like good music, you're obligated to check it out. And while you're at it, check out the Malpractice 45 that I reissued, which is from Manchester, New Hampshire, 1977. Look at that rock band on the back. That's Gigi Allen and Merle Allen and a dude named Jeff Penny and a guy named Brian Demers. And they made a very tasty original 70s rock record. You would never dream this was Gigi Allen on drums, which it is, and Merle Allen on bass. Even regardless of that, it's a cool-ass record that sounds great. What else did I get while I was down there? Ooh, how about this? The Savage Beat double 7-inch single featuring guest vocals by Jeff Clayton and by Jerry A. of Poison Idea. Haven't heard it yet? I'm excited to hear it. Antiscene.com's got some, I don't doubt. What else did I get? Man, this is really great. I'm geeking out big time. John Bridges says the Malpractice record is an awesome record. John Bridges, the lead singer of the Street Clones, is correct. Man, we got a few lead singers on board tonight. We got John from the Street Clones. We got Jeff Clayton himself. We got Mike Lesser from the Gay Cowboys in Bondage. You got me. Who else? How many other lead singers do we have here in the house? We got James Pogo from the Arm Delight Rifles. Any other lead singers I'm missing? I want I want all lead singers to post a comment right now. I want you to say, I am a lead singer with your band. Strut your stuff. Make your voice heard. Let people know who you are and what you do with your band. That's at least part of what Tent Talks Tunes is all about, baby. Populism. Populism with bands that I think are worth a good goddamn. So strut your stuff. Fly your colors. Let's see what your flag looks like. Do it now. Now, nope, there's Stefan. From a long way away, lead singer of the Suicide Junkies. Very nice. Y'all keep representing. I'm going to keep on geeking out here. We're sort of going to, we're going to veer back to the mailbox. I'll admit that I actually, I mail ordered this one, and there's no way you can possibly see this. But with my phone being the piece of junk that it is. But maybe you guys know that I am a hardcore numismat. That is to say, I'm a coin collector to the max. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and I am guilty of trawling the internet looking for coin bargains. And I found a really amazingly underpriced coin that I just thought was really cool. This is a silver denarium from ancient Rome, approximately 42 BC. On the front, you've got Marcus Junius Brutus, one of the guys who stabbed Julius Caesar to death. Brutus on the A, and on the B, you've got a picture of two daggers and a freed man's cap. Brutus minted this coin after he murdered Judy, Julius Caesar and put the two long knives and the freed slave's cap on the back. That guy was unrepentant with his deeds. So this is the this is a pretty legit piece of history, and I wish I could show it to you better. I love coin collecting. But I paid for it. Who cares? It was damn cheap. Oh, I see a lot of people posting that they're lead singers of different bands. Keep them coming, dudes. Keep them coming. I want to know who you are and who you sing for, and where you do it and why you do it and how you do it. Ain't nothing wrong with lead singers. Most bands wouldn't be much without lead singers. Speaking of lead singers, while I was down in North Carolina, I got some pretty cool records. Yes, 
I got records. This is all show and tell, baby, right here. Me and my girl Chrissy took a day trip to Asheville, North Carolina, just to kind of wander around and be in Asheville and check out the vibe and get some food and uh, check out the record stores, of course. And I accidentally stumbled upon a pressing plant. I had no idea that Asheville had a pressing plant. They got a pressing plant in Asheville. Very interested in checking that out, you know? Because I'm in North Carolina often enough to where I'm thinking I could press something in Asheville, perhaps, and then just pick it up in person, thus saving lots and lots of money on shipping. We'll see. It's an option. Excuse me, the place also had a record store where I got this really cool album, the Verace album. Yes, Edgar Verace. Double LP of some very interesting avant-garde electronic compositions and things like that. And it was really, really inexpensive. I can't believe it was as cheap as it was. Verace. Double album. Gotta love it. Verace was not a lead singer. I see more lead singer comments coming. Keep them coming. Lead singers unite and fight. Ain't nothing wrong with the avant-garde either, baby. Verace. Where would Frank Zappa be without Verace? Look it up. He wouldn't have been much of nowhere. This is a really cool record I found. I've talked many times on Tent Talks Tunes about my love for cheesy, sleazy exploitation records, mostly dating from the 60s and the 70s, maybe even the 50s. And one of my favorite genres of cheesy exploitation records is the Beatles exploitation record. And one of the, the greatest of all was the, <laughs> the utterly artless 1965 talk album of Ed Rudy interviewing the Beatles, a guy who shamelessly, shamelessly promotes himself as the fifth Beatle. How many fifth Beatles were there anyway? More than five. I think it'd be really hilarious, and I wish this, I wish this had happened. I wish this had happened. Think about this. 1964, Let's pick a wrestling arena, let's say Cobo Hall in Detroit, or the Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto, or uh, the Mid-South Coliseum in Charlotte. Wrestling arena, wrestling ring in the middle of the arena, thousands of screaming fans packed into the arena to see the Battle Royal, featuring everybody who claimed to be a fifth Beatle put in the ring simultaneously to duke it out and determine who got to be the fifth Beatle. The last man standing got to be the fifth Beatle. Unquestioned, uncontested. I think that would have been quite a spectacle. And you know who I would have bet my money on? The wrestler, George Ringo. George Ringo, the wrestling Beatle. I think George Ringo would have whipped ass on Murray the K. I think George Ringo would have kicked Ru Ed Rudy's butt. I think George Ringo, the wrestling beetle would, have, beetle, would have mopped the mat with Brian Epstein, or Neil Aspinall, or Pete Best, or Jimmy Nickel. George Ringo, the wrestling beetle. You might think I'm joking. Look it up. George Ringo, the wrestling beetle. Anyway, look at the look at the layout. Look at the cover graphics on that front cover. All hand set. All two-dimensional primary colors. You got a picture of the backs of the heads of the beetles. The layout is crappy. The colors are gaudy. I love this. This to me is better than almost any computer-generated art you will ever see. It's all cut and paste. It's all rude and crude. Helpful explanation on the front. 
The man with the dark glasses at extreme left is Ed Rudy, the fifth Beatle. Here he stands next to the Beatle Boys. One word, the Beatle Boys. Prior to taping an interview. As, left to right, John, Paul, George, and Ringo's mop tops are photographed in all their shining splendor. That is so cheesy, you could put it on a piece of toast and make a sandwich out of it. Love this kind of stuff. So this was a really good find at a record shop in Wilmington. John, Br <laughs> John Bridges says that Billy Preston might stand a chance. True that. Billy Preston versus George Ringo might be a good bout. Just might be a good bout. What else did we pick up? Well, I didn't pick, up this, didn't pick this up at a record store, but I did pick up, remember, Fanboy. Fanboy. I saw a post earlier today from Tony Martin, who was the lead singer of Black Sabbath from 1987 to 1995. Tony Martin posted about how he got Cozy Powell to autograph a couple of records, even though Tony Martin and Cozy Powell were in Black Sabbath together. I thought that was very touching. I thought that was a real mark of genuine fandom that you would ask for an autograph from a guy you're in a band with. I think that's just cool. I think that's really cool. And it also kind of validated my efforts because whenever we get an object like this, and this once again gets into record collector nerddom, the test pressing for the upcoming Anti-Scene Live in Quarantine album, the Anti-Scene Halloween Quarantine test pressing, what do I do? Because I gotta do it. I get the boys in the band to sign it. Because I'm not just in the band, I'm a fan. And you, there's definitely no way you can see this, but there wasn't any room on the, uh, the label for me to sign my own record. So I wrote in the runout wax, property of Malcolm Tent. And that's a big clue for you guys. If you ever, ever, ever on eBay, see an anti-scene autographed record that says property of Malcolm Tent, you will know that either I have just become completely homeless and that I'm living in a gutter or that I've died. It's the only way you're going to see these for sale anywhere. Because I'm a fan. This record is hotter than Vesuvius on a bad day. I listened to it, I marked out, even though I'm in the band. Can I get an amen? Amen. So whenever this thing is finally officially available, you'll hear about it, and I recommend that you fasten your seatbelts in advance, because it's a good one. Another real good record I got that was given to me by, hey, by John Bridges, who's watching right now. This was an unexpected treat. This is a record by a group called <laughs> Sex Grimes. British band. I'm going to guess that they're old, loud, and snotty. Completely offensive. Very funny. They play the style of 80s hardcore that I grew up on. Excuse me, I cut my teeth on early 80s hardcore the stuff that was written and played before there was such a thing as a mosh part. There were no mosh parts in the hardcore that I grew up on. And this record totally harkens back to it. This is a, I, I love this record. I was not really expecting to like this record as much as I did. But this record is really cool. And John Bridges says they're Australian. Right on. So John, thank you so very much for this. I really appreciate it. It's a release on Mystery School Records. I'm sure, John Bridges, since you're there, maybe you would be kind enough to post a link to Mystery School Records. I know the label's kind of in hibernation right now, but if you've got a web store or something, I invite you to post a link, because you've released a lot of cool stuff, including this record. And 
when the day comes and I'm ever on the radio again, you will hear one of the very few Sex Grimes records that are actually radio friendly. You will hear it. Promise. Which brings us almost to the very end. One final record I got while I was shopping around and buying and trading and wheeling and dealing. A record that I've had my eye on for a very long time, pretty much since the day it came out in 1985. But never actually pulled the trigger on it. But I did it because I sold some records to a record store. I had a nice trade credit going and decided to use a little bit of that trade credit towards picking up this record, Swa. Your future if you have one. Swa, for those of you who may or may not know, was Chuck Dukowski's band after he was thrown out of Black Flag. And it was on SST Records. And that was always kind of problematic because SST was simultaneously one of the greatest labels that ever put out a record. On the other hand, one of the worst labels that ever put out a record. SST put out, who even knows how many records? 300 plus, I believe, maybe even 400. And the quality control was non-existent, really. There, there was none. Uh, I think the rule was if Greg Ginn liked it, he'd put it out. And there was some good stuff, for sure. There was also some stuff that only Greg Ginn would like. Didn't matter to him. So because of that somewhat spotty reputation, even as far back as 1985, I was very leery about the SWA record. Because, you know, God bless them, bands like, you know, some of the Black Flag spin-off bands like October Faction, Tom Tricoli's Dog, um, I might be able to think of a couple others. Yeah. Acquired taste, to say the best, you know, to really, to give it a lot of credit and acquired taste. So a little bit leery about SWA. But I had read uh, an interview with Chuck Dukowski where he talked about his songwriting. And he made a point that he never stopped writing songs. Like, he started writing songs before Black Flag, during Black Flag, and after Black Flag. So there was a definite continuity to his songwriting. And I thought, well, you know what? That is a valid point, you know? Just because he wasn't in Black Flag anymore doesn't mean that the songs he was writing are all of a sudden not valid. Right? Kind of makes sense. And I was really turned around to that when I got the Worm double LP anthology that came out on Record Store Day, or Record Scam Day, as I like to call it, a few years back. A double LP by his band Worm. Because that was written and recorded immediately after he was thrown out of Black Flag. So there's an absolute line of continuity between I see the, the wheel turning on my for Schlugener broadcaster, so I don't know if my train of thought is being interrupted, so I'm kind of doing a holding action here until it stops turning. And I might have to repeat myself a little bit. So you guys bear with me. This is the problem of technology. Assuming that my words are even being heard right now. So once the wheel stops turning on the computer screen, I'm going to continue with my train of thought. And I'm almost done, so just bear with me. We're, we're almost there. We're at the, about the one hour mark, and so... Am I fine? Okay, Larry Mann says that I'm still going out. So, all right. I'm going to make the point that there was a definite line of continuity in 1983 from the songs that Chuck Dukowski wrote for Black Flag to Worm. He went straight from one to the other. And wouldn't you know it? That Worm record is damn good. It's real good. It's got chops. It is highly recommended. I don't, I don't know if it's been reissued or if it's still in print anymore, but that Worm record was awesome. And so that made me want to take the next step 
from 83 to 85 to check out the SWA record. And I played it, and the verdict is it ain't that good. Hate to say it, it's not that good. It's competent, it's rock music, it's kind of done by the numbers. Meryl Ward, not the greatest singer in the world. It definitely, in my opinion, falls kind of short of the mark. Not a great record. It's got two really good songs on it. It's got great song titles. I mean, Sine, Cosine, X, Ten Miles of Hate, Islands in the Freeway. Those are great song titles. And Islands in the Freeway is a good song. Caravan's a really good song. Those are the two songs on the album that sort of cut loose and sort of pushed the bounds a little bit. The rest of it, pretty much by the numbers. So after whatever, 37 years of putting it off, I finally heard this SWA record, and I was quite underwhelmed. Stefan says I should check out the other SWA record. Fair enough. I'll also mention that Dukowski has done a lot of really cool stuff since then. His band, the CD6, that's tasty. That's That really pushes the limits. I like the CD6. First SWA record, sorry, can't do it. But I've been, it's been recommended to me that I ch should check out more SWA, so I will. We try to keep the mind open around here on Tent Talks Tunes. And that, my friends, concludes this evening's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. I wish to thank you all again for tuning in and listening to me babble, rant, rave, ramble, and rip out. I do hope to be back in about 167 hours. Between now and then, I look forward to reading your comments. I look forward to hearing from y'all via Messenger or on the Facebook. And um, hope everybody's doing well and rocking out. So until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State.